halftime show. Now for the halftime entertainment, said the announcer. Birds and humans of all varieties, please enjoy the forging of the world by the Royal Reinhardt Ballet. The light above the stadium was darkened, and the spotlight of a single yellow dancer was illuminated on the flat field. She wore an almost white-coloured suit, which sparkled in the light. In the beginning was the mother, said a female voice in Solomon's head. She was on a lone planet, desolate and empty. She waited, knowing what was to come. Solomon found himself entranced by the lights as they swirled and danced upon the field. He remembered hearing about the mother in the library. Suddenly two large shapes descended downwards from the sky, one white and one black. They swirled around each other, their presence stark against the yellow backdrop. The twin dragons, chaos and order, emerged from the far reaches of space. The mother had known they were coming, as they were hungry for the nearby sun that Gaia orbited, said the voiceover. The dancer seemed to summon the two swirling streaks of light and shadow down to where she stood, their bodies dancing together as they whirled around in a spiral. The twin dragons, thought Solomon. Could the black one be the spider dragon? The mother lured the twins to where she stood upon the barren earth. She told the twins of the life that was to come, of the worlds of colour and creatures that would inhabit it, said the voiceover. The light and shadow danced around the glittery mother, as though a giant hula hoop encircled her. The twins did not care for the life of humans. They sought only to bring the end to the sun. The female dragon, Chaos, would eat it from the inside and create a black hole, or the white male dragon, Order, would crush it into a neutron star. The twins bickered between themselves, all the while the mother inched closer to where they flew until said the announcer with anticipation. The female dancer brought forth a glass object, and the black and white streak suddenly vanished. She used a prism to hold the twins inside, created long ago by the mother and her predecessors. She captured the twins within it, their souls trapped inside, while their bodies became limp and lifeless. The lone dancer moved across the field. It was with the bodies of the dragons that the mother forged Gaia, with their horns she made the mountains, their breath, the deserts, the scales, the rocks, the claws, the trees, and their blood, the seas. The dancer brought forth large objects out of the ground with each announcement, the digital displays erupting out of the ground as she went along. From the bones she made flesh and formed a tribe of humans to roam and multiply. Nine sets of men and women, each with their own direction to go in. Before departing, she gave them a gift. More dancers flooded the field, two sets of nine. With a brilliant flash of light, the prison the dancer held projected a stunning rainbow arc across the field. For every colour of the rainbow did the mother make an edge. Yellow, orange, red, violet, indigo, green and blue. The edges were fashioned into clothing that the men and women could wear. For yellow, a medallion. For orange and red, rings. For indigo and violet, a belt buckle. For green, braces. And for blue, boots. With the edges bestowed upon each of the men and women, their hair and eyes changed colour to match that of their edge. Someone watched as the dancers on the field changed colours and began going in different directions across the field. With their edges given to the people, they went to the corners of Gaia, yet there was still power inside the prism, dark power that the mother would not allow humans to possess. The dancer brought forth the prism once again and projected two beams of light, producing black and white objects. The cowl of darkness and the tiara of light, said the voiceover. Taken to the furthest reaches of Gaia and protected by ancient creatures, they stayed locked and protected from those that would wish to try and take them. The lives of Gaia's inhabitants flourished, and it is only because of the mother that we exist here today. As one, the stadium chanted, Mother, give us colour, and rapturous applause broke out across the stadium. The lights came back on, and the dancers waved and bowed their thanks to the crowd. Solomon was spellbound by what he had seen and heard, amazed how accurate the history of Gaia was to the prison forums back on Earth. He'd known about the rainbow edges and the forbidden light and dark edges, though not to such detail. It amazed him how much of Gaia's history was due to the mother. 
Yet her identity was still a mystery to Solomon, who wondered who she was and how she had communicated to Kobe. It was only after a short while after the fat parrot and his friends returned, their eyes narrowing when they met Solomon's, grimacing at his presence. They seemed somewhat rowdier as a aroma of alcohol lingered in the air. Solomon had a bad feeling of what would happen if he provoked them further, remembering his father's temper when he'd been drinking. Solomon had learned an angry drunk was best to avoid. Solomon kept his eyes forward, and the Sunball Tournament was underway once again. We welcome you back to the Sunball Tournament, said the announcer. Now for the men's event. A scores of bird-like men took the field one after the other and had very similar fates to that of the women, though it seemed the men used different strategies. Where the women were sleek and able to move easier, the men tried to barrel their way through the course, using their strength rather than deafness. Despite the different approach, only a few men made single sundowns, but none were able to score doubles like Cyber Sun had. The fat parrot near Kobe had grown increasingly loud and boorish, seemingly drunk from the day's festivities. Solomon noted them muttering and glancing over at him, as though waiting for an opportunity to hurl abuse. Solomon kept his eyes on the game, not wanting to start a fight. His attention was pulled away by the announcer calling out, Cockatoo Collins is our next contender for the Sunball tournament. His name registered with Solomon, and he cheered amidst a sea of boos. He too was a human competitor, an extended mane of long hair that raised and lowered like the crest of a cockatoo upon his head. It fanned up and down, his face a scowl at the crowd who booed him. Solomon cheered, drawing the faces of the birds upon him, but he forgot himself, enjoying seeing the human competitor. Cockatoo took to the sky, the ball tucked under his arm. He deftly navigated the course, and in a blink of an eye, he was at the other end, crossing the line for a sundown. The crowd were not too pleased by the result, eliciting a furious response. We remind you once again that all competitors are welcome at the Sunball tournament. Any anti-social behaviour or thinking will be punishable, said the announcer. Cockatoo bowed mockingly to the crowd, drawing their eye even more. The fat bird and his friends were amongst them. You're a sewer rat, screamed one. Go back to the bottom of the cage, yelled another. Good one, cockatoo, shouted Solomon, making all eyes turn upon him. He's going to win, you know, Solomon said to the stunned birds around him. He's going to win the tournament. All the birds clucked and laughed at him. Before the fat parrot had a chance to speak, Cockatoo was back up in the air again, diving and weaving his way through the course. What a brilliant display Cockatoo is putting on. He certainly improved from last sunball. Cockatoo rose up sharply as a geyser burst beneath him, the crowd ooing and ahhing as he left the air carrying up before somersaulting backwards and free-falling into a dive. At the last minute, he pulled up to skirt the surface of the ground and crossed the line for yet another sundown. He's got a double, cheered the announcer over the boos and jeers of the crowd. Debris had started to rain against the force field, the crowd against the competitor. Once more, Cockatoo waved cheerfully at them, egging them on and eliciting more distaste from the crowd. The fat parrot near Solomon wheeled around, glaring at Solomon square in the face. Not a word, boy, he spat. A word from you and it'll be your last. His words were slurry, and his eyes glassy. Solomon had seen that look before. It was the same he'd gotten from his father when he'd come home drunk. He'd learned to hide in his room and avoid making him angry, something that was almost impossible to do. But this was not his home, and he was not a child. He detested the crowd for the vilification of Cockatoo's performance just because of what he was. It was exactly what he'd been fighting against all his life. What word wouldn't you have me say? goaded Solomon in response. One celebrating the double sundown? The double sundown that none of your bird competitors were able to accomplish? Or would it be words that you were inferior to human performers, maybe? That you think yourself superior, but beneath you just a coward? Any of those words is what you might have in mind? He asked with a sneer. The fat parrot blinked, seemingly shocked by the gall of Solomon. Solomon knew he was coming. The fat bird screeched and charged at him, his friends along with him too. Solomon was ready though, leaping up onto an empty seat and extending his wings before taking to the sky. The fat bird crashed into the empty space Solomon had just been, his friends along with him. Swears and curses were hurled at him as the birds untackled themselves and took to the sky, their wings disturbing those of the other attendees around them. We remind all patrons to remain in their perches or seats while the sunball match is being played, said the announcer. Hundreds of patrons yelled at Solomon and the group of birds who suddenly blocked their view of the match. Get down here, you skinny little worm, said the fat parrot. 
You'll have to catch me first, said Solomon, who raced off along the outskirts of the stadium, the crowd shouting and waving at them to get out of the way as Cockatoo went for his third sundown. Solomon caught glimpses of him moving across the field, but his attention was focused on getting away from the birds in pursuit. He rounded the farthest edge of the stadium when a voice sounded in his head. Solomon and Lil, it said, you are violating the policies of the Sunball tournament. Please return to your seat immediately or you'll be removed. Solomon replied, make the birds stop chasing me, then I'll go back. He came to the southernmost point of the stadium and landed in an empty area where foods were being served. He was greeted by two large golden birds, the same as the ones that taken him to the Howling Heights. Return to your seat once the attempt is over, said the bird sharply, or you'll be removed. Stop them from attacking me, said Solomon, pointing at the group of birds who landed on the ground nearby and moved in. They froze as they saw the golden eagle standing next to Solomon, their faces paling. A sullen exchange went on between the group and the eagles, unbeknownst to Solomon. They have said that you've been culturally insensitive to the competitors, said the eagle to Solomon. We ask that you leave the Sunball tournament immediately. What? shouted Solomon. They're the ones being... They have all stated the same claim against you as witness. That is evidence enough. Leave now, or you'll be removed by force, said the eagle. But that is... argued Solomon, but at that moment, a sharp claw opened before his face. You have a choice. We suggest it be a wise one.